the speedboat just turned, came, smacked into us, went into the air, fell on my head. So a boat literally landed on me while I was riding on another boat and experienced so many bizarre mental experiences. Like I was seeing ghosts. It was basically like I was living, I was a little boy in the sixth sense and kind of seeing these ghosts and dead beings everywhere and just haunted. Hey everyone, I want to welcome you back to another episode of The Soul Inspired. Today I have Molly Murray with me and she has had a near-death experience, but also kind of a transformation in her life where she overcame some severe illness. And we're going to dig deep into that and chat with her. But thanks, first of all, thanks for being on the show, Molly. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me here, Joe. I'm super excited about this. Yeah, as I was saying before we started recording here, um, you were one of the first people I heard from when I put out the first call for the the first guest. So I was really excited to finally get to you here. It's been a few months, but now we kind of are get to chat about what what you've overcome and overcame and your experience you had. So I always direct the episode first by asking a simple question. And if if you think about when this happened to you, when this experience happened to you, whether it was um, the illness related I don't, again, we don't know yet. We're going to find out soon what happened, but the near death experience and the illness and all that. If you think about before that, what was life like for Molly? Like, what was your life like growing up a little bit? Just a little overview of your beliefs and what your life was like. Let's see. Well, I was a very intense child. Um, I was 15 when it happened. So let's see. Before that, I was just straight A student full of huge dreams. Um, I was planning to have an academic career. I was very academic and um, invested in that kind of path, wanted to go to an Ivy League college and just kind of progress um, into Ivy League spaces. Um, I also used my voice a lot. I love to sing. So I I thought about being a singer-songwriter too. Um, life for me. My, my family was in, um, an evangelical offshoot. So now looking back, I see that it was kind of, um, it's not what I align with now, but at the time we were just a happy family. I really enjoyed adventures in the mountains. We'd recently moved from Louisiana to Montana. And so that culture shock was very difficult for me, but I was really enjoying the mountains by that time, had some good friends and was just kind of enjoying life as a 15 year old. Okay. So pretty standard lifestyle. You have some religious upbringing Mm -hmm. and you had, you know, these inspirations of what you wanted to become in, in academics and in work, even though you're only 15. So good for you. Some people don't figure that out till they're like 40. Um, But you know, at the same time, like you, you seemed like you were kind of on a path at that point. And so let's, let's dive right into what happened to you uh, when you're around 15 then, and you can go through your experience a little bit and let us know. Okay. So when I was 15, I was on a pontoon boat with my family. My cousins were visiting from Louisiana. So we went up to this beautiful place called the gates of the mountains. It's a very historic place in Montana where Lewis and Clark first kind of came through the mountains and made some historic declaration And it's basically a really beautiful place, but it's kind of this narrow channel where a river runs from one lake to another. And it's a very striking picturesque and the water actually goes down thousands of feet. And it's like this amazing mountain gorge. Um, So anyhow, we are going down this, this channel on a pontoon boat, which, you know, does not have much mobility And the driver of a speedboat did not look before he turned, just ran straight into it, smacked into our boat and fell on me in my head and life changed forever. So I was not aware of this. Of course, Um, I woke up from a coma two weeks later and kind of had to relearn everything. Um, how to read, how to write, just social cues. Um, And I had such, it was a very close near-death experience. 
Um, I flatlined at one point and it was very, very traumatic, of course, for my family. There were people praying for me all across America and Canada too, actually. Um, I was actually kind of a local celebrity because it was such a crazy experience. Like people would literally point to me on the street after that and be like, oh my gosh, there's that girl who was hit by a boat. Oh, wow. Because at the time it was so, I mean, I still haven't heard of anybody who survived from something that severe. You're on this pontoon boat and mm -hmm. a larger boat um, runs into I'm you or did I, where did I lose that? It so. was a speed boat. And okay. it was, so it was going really, really fast, you know, mm. and pontoon boats don't really have the mobility. So the speed boat just turned, came, smacked into us, went into the air fell on my head. Wow. So a boat literally landed on me while I was riding on another boat. Wow. Which, so that, so that would knock you out and put you into a coma. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I can, I can see how that happened and you're right. A uh, majority of people probably wouldn't survive that. That seems like a very traumatic, not only brain injury type um, situation, but could be spinal, could be neck, could be like there's so many things that could happen or go wrong in that experience. So you flatlined, you're saying while you were in the hospital or you remember flatlining when the that happened? Um, so that was when I was in the hospital. So after the boat fell on me, I went, you know, I experienced a severe um, traumatic brain injury, was picked up by helicopter and brought to a hospital um, nearby. Um, I had a lot of neurosurgeons, working on me and um it was just touch and go for like two weeks and at some point during those two week two weeks I flatlined and um the doctors were trying all sorts of experimental procedures because at that point there was just absolutely no precedent of anyone recovering from anything that severe. And I mean um neuroscience has progressed so much since that point to where we are today. So that the ex things that they tried on me were very experimental at the time. Didn't know if I would survive or not. Um, yeah. And at some point I flatlined and then kind of um, eventually came back to life and just, but they had no idea if I would wake up or mm -hmm. how far I would wake up, how far I would recover, what kind of intelligence level or maturity level I'd be able to reach um, all that they could tell me was that I would likely be as far as I could get in three years time, but they had wow. no idea what it would look like. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thanks for sharing that, by the way. Um, so I can already tell by the way you're describing this, that in this reality with our, I always call them meat suits in this reality, <laughs> It, was, it seemed like it was difficult for you to even tell the time of when things happen, right? Like this flatlining happened at some point. Like, because if you're in a coma, you don't, you're probably in and out, right? Like I would imagine you're kind of, it's probably a foggy experience. Um, you don't really know time the same way because you're, mm -hmm. you're you, 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 like you said, you woke up two weeks later, whatever waking up means, right? But, so correct me if I'm wrong with that, but I also want to know, did you have any type of experience that seemed different from this, from you and I talking right now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, most of it I know is blank. Like now I look back and it's like for years, it was just like I lost two weeks of my life and I would find I was chronically late on things, just kind of like 10 days late in development and all sorts of things. I'd just be like, that is so weird. I kind of just lost two weeks of my life yeah. and it was just this blank space. Um, I can remember having some weird dreams and nightmares during that time. And then um, I remember also this point of kind of through the blackness coming and experiencing coming through this like channel or tunnel of light and coming, um, I don't know if it was, well, I assume it was to heaven's gate and kind of having this conversation I've done a lot of healing around this point, And now I know that my soul chose to come back to earth. Um, but I know that I experienced this, you know, this wild experience of just going through the light and meeting these beings of light. And then honestly, I was 
disappointed to to wake up. It was very hard to reconcile living in this meat suit for years. And I just wished I had died. You know, I was like, why did I do that? Why couldn't I just have died and not have to bother with all of this? Because recovery is not fun. It was so painful and excruciatingly. I was just in agony for years because it was such a painful experience, like mentally and physically and emotionally and everything. I was just in turmoil. And um, so I, I definitely wished I had passed away, mm. but it made so much sense after I did the healing around that moment and found out that I had chosen to come back and live a mission on earth. Yeah, that's that's remarkable. So, okay. So again, on this show, we've had quite a few near-death experiencers and we have lots coming. Um, it seems to be the niche that's really coming into the Soul Inspired podcast. Um, we started with all kinds of different things and I think every once in a while we'll get different topics, which is great, but it seems like the, the it's one of my biggest passions is near-death experiences. I've been like that since I was young for different reasons. I've explained on other episodes, but what I would ask you is this. You, you said a few interesting things. You said some things that I've heard similar to other experiencers and then but yours is a little different in the sense where you said th th you're actually the first person I've talked to who was more in a long term, like a, in a coma for a while. And um, so that's interesting because you were in this coma and you said you were having weird dreams and nightmares and you define them as dreams and nightmares. So the question I would have for you is if you compare this moment that happened with the tunnel of light, seeing soul beings, these things, these types of things. Did that feel just as much as like the dreams or was there a difference in the feeling of those two things? There was a big difference that felt like reality. It felt like I myself was experiencing it instead of kind of watching myself experience it. Like the dreams, I would kind of see myself watching, you know, I had this, you know, the, just this feeling of being other or outside and watching it happen and knowing it was a dream, even though I hated the feelings and it was very confusing. Mm -hmm. And then um, that experience with the light, I just felt completely present. It was me. I was experiencing it myself like I was experiencing reality. Okay. Did it feel as real as right now, you talking to me? Yes, absolutely. That's so interesting. No one has ever asked me that about it before, but it's a very good distinction. Okay. So when you have the memory of it, when you think of it, like tomorrow when you wake up, you'll have the memory of you and I talking today. Okay. When you think of that experience you had, does it feel like that? Like it's a memory, like it's an actual memory of a moment you had as opposed mm -hmm. to like a dream. You know, when you, when you think back to a dream or sometimes you have reoccurring dreams, <clears throat> have you had those? And you go, oh, I remember having that dream, but it feels like a dream each time. Like there's something about it. Maybe it does mean it's spiritual in nature. We don't know um, the, the idea of what dreams are. I'd love to get a dream uh, expert on, on the show sometime, but the biggest takeaway that I get from a lot of people who've had these NDEs is that it, they, and I'm not, I don't want to say this and in, in influence what you're about to say, but they're, the way they describe it is they say it, it's, it's just as real as this um, present moment, or if not more real, or it's almost like a, it's like two different shades of real, but it's definitely real as opposed to a dream. It's not, uh, so it's not similar to a dream in any way. That's mm -hmm. what I usually get. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. Because I can actually remember the dreams that I had while I was in my coma. Mm -hmm. Again, they were very disturbing. And I had this sense of watching the dreams unfold, watching myself, watching these dreams unfold. You know, I was kind of the observer. Whereas in the experience with the lights, I was present. And the nearest experience to that that I've had is just the sense of presence you have when you're meditating or in creative flow and you're fully present, fully aware, fully taking part in every part of your being, you know, it's just all there, all in. Right. Whereas the dream, it was just kind of this uncomfortable obs observation. Mm. Here's, here's a weird concept and I've never brought this up on an episode, but I'm going to say it now. And I want to, I want to see how you feel about it. The interesting thing for you is you were having dreams and you had this experience around the same time frame, right? Within the time that you were mm -hmm. hospitalized and things like that. Is it, is it an odd assumption? Could it be an, a, an odd assumption to feel as if you as Molly 
are here on the physical 3D here and had a dream from whatever that dream mindset is. So that's Molly's dream. Okay. So Molly, you having this dream, the nightmares, the whatever happened there. And then when you went to the other, this other moment with the soul beings, you realize that this is their dream. Like it's almost the same kind of concept. Like you went in different stages. Like here's who you really are. Here's Molly. And here's Molly's dream. If it's almost like a layer layering effect. Now I'm probably saying it in an odd way, but it's almost like we're the dream of our soul. And then your dream, like we come here as humans and we, we experience a dream when we're a soul, our dream is this experience. I don't know. It's just kind of an, it's kind of a concept. It's a thought because we seem to bring things here from that realm. I talk to people who say like, oh yeah, birds are in heaven or, but they're more beautiful or grass is more real or, but it's like, we have that here, but it's kind of like gray and dark compared to what they see. So I'm always like, maybe we're like the soul's dream. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I love that. That, that sounds like Narnia. It's very <laughs> meta kind of like inception, you know, dream within a dream. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely feel that way to some extent, you know, it's all just a, our souls are on their journey and learning what they need to know. And so there is a sense of us who we are truly are like our beings actually being a part and watching this unfold, just like I was watching those dreams unfold. So I think you're like onto something really interesting there. Mm -hmm. In yeah. the same, in the, in the same sense, like what you just said is perfect because how many times do you have a dream in this world and you tell a friend or a family member and they say, oh, you know why you probably had that dream? Because you have to overcome that obstacle you're facing. And it's just so, oh, OK, so my dream actually might help me. Right. It mm -hmm. might actually help me grow as a human. And what if our human helps our soul grow? So, again, dream concept. Right. So I have thought it I've just never said it on an episode. And I'm like, it's just an interesting idea that there's this idea that where we are our soul's dream. And that's why we, when we come here, we incarnate, we get the ability of having dreams much like our soul is dreaming. So like we're kind of a, an image of ourself, right? That's our higher self. And we're now an image. We, we hear the term image of God, right? I don't know what your memory is of the experience you had. I don't know if it's faded or if it comes back to you. It sounds, you did mention you do meditation and things like that. And that you've had some, um, you, you mentioned that you've done some work that has kind of brought more to light of your experience. Do you remember anything specifically about the beings or was it just, you just remember the beings? I just remember the beings, these beings of light, Jesus. Um, it was just really pure light around me. And, and again, like you're talking, like the reality of it was like, this was real light and I knew it, you know, and it was light that you can feel. And it wasn't like a fire. It was more just like this, kind of tangible like light <clears throat> and um and I knew I just had the sense that it was Jesus and I wasn't sure who the others were but I just you know assumed angels these beings of light and again their presence was just I mean it was it's like when you are around someone and you're kind of connected so you feel their presence or you know you're not alone in the room you know but it was that kind of feeling except it was just so tangible and so strong um very warm. And it just, yes, it, it was all the beautiful feels, you know, I knew it was going not to be all right, because that sounds so like cliche and trite. Um, but I knew it was, I guess, a higher purpose, you know, kind of the sense that like, we are here for a reason and there's direction. Do you find that the experience is somewhat faded or do you know more or feel more, but it's a very personal thing and you don't talk about it? Oh, um, actually, well, so I, sorry to go back to your last question about mm -hmm. the work that I've done around it. I've actually been able to uncover a lot more of it. And that's a really interesting journey too, because, um, at the time I couldn't remember anything and like, and it is, it's, it is a journey after a traumatic brain injury like that for your memory to come back. Um, so I only remembered these feelings and this sense of the light. Like I always remembered that even when I woke up, I told my parents about it. Um, and I remembered those dreams and I remembered all the emotions that I experienced during the, the disturbing nightmares and during that beautiful experience with the light. Um, and so as time progressed, those 
things were always very present with me, but the, um, the actual experience itself, that's what I've done a lot of work, like subconscious work to kind of recover. Um, because, um, I don't know if you're, if you're so into near death experiences, I'm sure you've seen the movie Memento. Do you remember that from like with Guy Pierce and yeah, yes. great yes. movie. So my life was really like that. Mm. I, um, I kind of purposefully covered up like the recovery itself was so disturbing because I went through so many, so much trauma mentally and experienced so many bizarre mental experiences. Like I was seeing ghosts. It was basically like I was living, I was the little boy in the sixth sense and kind of seeing these ghosts and dead beings everywhere and just haunted. Wow. Um, yeah, I really hated recovery. There were, there were so many, difficult agonizing things about it. And so hmm. when I reached kind of that three-year limit that the doctors said, I was always like, you know, if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. And my parents were amazing. Like now that I know all about manifestation, I know that they were manifesting good things. They didn't really know about it at the time either, but I know just because they never gave me any limitations. They were never like, everyone kind of had this expectation out in the medical community that I might not get past maybe second or third grade because mm -hmm. that's how far people usually went. But my parents were just always like, well, let's see how far you can go and then go a little farther and let's do this and then do that. So let's see mm -hmm. if you can get through high school and then see if you can do the next thing, you know? Um, which is, so which is great. I mean, to have that support, that's a big deal, you know, and that, that can really change someone's outcome. Because, um, oh, and you, absolutely. and like you said, you, you, with manifesting, and we can talk a little bit about that at some point here, but, um, you, you know, if you have more people on your side, believing the same thing, it's a very likely situation that it's going to happen. You know, there's more likelihood that something is going to happen because you're not the only one seeing it as more people buy into your story and what's happening. Like your parents did, if they had a lot of faith and belief that you're going to recover, I think that helps because, you know, oh, I think absolutely. it's just that energy is just more magnetized than just you, uh, you know, trying to believe it's going to occur. So that's that's a really good message for people out there. If you have mm -hmm. someone that's gone through a traumatic event or, you know, someone, you know, is ill with something, it's probably the best thing you can probably do is have that positive outlook and f find experiences like this so that you because a lot of it, I think, is belief. If we don't hear other people's experiences, that's why I think hearing these episodes, hearing people's experiences is so important because that helps the human, that helps us as a human believe it can be true. Oh, that person recovered? How, okay, how did they do that? Okay, wow. And then all of a sudden that belief system changes. And I think that's a lot of the way that we work. And I, again, our brains, I think are much more powerful than we give credit for. Um, I've always said too, with the brain, I mind and brain are different, but I think we only come here. The reason why we can't remember being souls and stuff and all these different things in our past lives or whatever we might've had. I think that I look at the brain now. This is just my, again, these are all talking to all my uh, listeners out there. These are my beliefs and, and things. So I'm not pushing my beliefs to anyone, but I almost feel like sometimes the brain is almost like this um, interrupter. It, it's almost like a, it interrupts and, and it, it, we, the reason why we can't remember things is because it, it fogs everything out. It's almost like a, like that radio sh sound, you know, it like makes it so you can't remember anything. And because you went through a brain injury, it was probably in hyper mode. Like a, your brain was just probably, do, 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 do. and so that's even more. And that's probably why you weren't even, even the, the experience itself, even though now you look back and you see that this soul experience has had this NDE you had that it felt real. But you couldn't remember it, but you also probably couldn't remember a lot of who Molly was before the injury. So it's the same thing because it's your reality that you're not remembering because the brain is in this state of, you know, and so I, I do believe and, and, and then you hear about people, you know, dying and I think the brain shuts off and all of a sudden we're like, oh, that's who we are. OK, because now everything's shut down. But when it's going, it's like we're here. That's all. That's all we know. Does that resonate and if it doesn't resonate i'd love to hear your your opinion on it. no it resonates so much and i love talking to you because yeah. so few people get this you know so that's why i generally don't talk about it as much 
just because um, I, I want my story to be out there for people who are going through this and going through a recovery, like you said. Um, but I've stopped talking about it as much just because people don't usually get it. Um, and I've got other passions that I pursue, but one of the, the reason I brought up that movie Memento is it's exactly that experience you're describing because I had lost all of these memories and I found, I would just find these clues of myself as I was going on. So, um, actually after high school, I had this experience, like I, I very intentionally wanted to start over and be a new person. I told maybe one or two people at college, um, what I'd been through. I just did not want anyone to know, you know, I was sick of being that kind of semi celebrity for something really awful. Right. And I mean, I even went to a couple of places and like States away and people would recognize me very occasionally. Mm -hmm. Um, and know who I was because of that. And so I just really wanted to start over and be like a new person. So I kind of adopted a new personality and just tried to shut that part of myself off so much. Um, and also like, I just had to cope, you know, I had to, in order to cope with life and live a normal life, I just had to cut off part of myself. But after I got through college, I found that I just, I was less and less able to kind of have that normal experience I mean, I would, I remember having to pull over when I was driving on the highway because I was being interrupted by these flashbacks of things that I didn't fully remember. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know, it was that same feeling of like, am I going crazy? So I knew that I had to go back and kind of heal those experiences. Um, And so that's when I started writing this book that I wrote about this experience and, um, But in order to do that, I had to go on this treasure hunt. And here's where it gets like the movie Memento because I went back to my parents' house and I had no idea what I was looking for or where to start. And I actually had this very distinct memory of burning all these journals that I had kept during high school, during the recovery period in a bonfire. And my parents thought that's what I'd done because I was like, I just wanted it to be over. Um, But anyhow, I just, I went back to their house and I was like, I'm going to find what I can And it was so weird. I actually went on this like treasure hunt where I'd get these soul nudges and clues to like follow certain things. I ended up in the very creepy loft in their barn, finding a box in the far corner with all the things from recovery that I had no memory of. My parents didn't know it was there, but it had all those journals and I had just blocked that off. So from my memory so that I could survive, It, it was very traumatic to uncover it. But I was at kind of a point of stability where I was able to go into it. And just to be able to go into creative flow and to write about it was so healing. Um, And I've learned since what happens during the process of creative flow, how it's actually very healing for your brain. And the process itself is, it's incredibly healing. It has so many benefits. And, um, but I truly believe that is how I survived because my parents always encouraged me to do creative things, just to enjoy myself, to do what I like to do. And it was like, I'm in so much pain. How can I? But I still, that was all I did was like, I played piano for hours a day. I read books. I wrote things. I did like art projects. This really resonates with me because it, I think our creative abilities are almost like in tune with our higher self at times too. And Mm -hmm. it allows us to kind of escape. And that's probably what was, it's almost like meditation, right? In a sense um great creativity when you're doing something you get into almost a meditative state now it's a little bit different than probably what you've wor- worked with with your meditation um but uh, that's great to know that you started really working on your creative outlets right mm-hmm. that's exactly it. it's actually very similar to what i do now so and that's i think that's what led me to rapid transformational therapy so i'm Rapid transformational therapy is a form of therapy where I go into the subconscious. I'm a subconscious guide. I lead people to go into the subconscious and heal these experiences that are buried there, this trauma. And it's all in this deep kind of theta meditation. And so when you're in that alpha theta state, which is the meditative state of the brain, that's the same state you go into when you're in creative flow. And you're actually able to rewrite your neurons to change your neural pathways and so I've, I made this connection and found this out about the relationship between creative flow and meditation. I was like, oh, it all makes sense now. That is why 
I was able to feel so much better and to heal during high school because I would basically live for these moments of flow. And then I just decided I'm going to try to expand them and expand them in my life. And I truly believe that's where I am now is because I did expand this flow in my life till I was completely living in flow. Mm -hmm. That was years later. But back in the time, just those moments that allowed me to escape the agony, that's kind of what led me forward and gave me that outlet to survive. No, that's great. I love that. And so it's called rapid transformational therapy. So that's what you do with clients. Mm -hmm. You you do that and help them recover past traumas, but do it in a in a way that's maybe a little less um well, I guess it is kind of in, not I was going to say less intrusive, but I guess it is because you're actually kind of going into um like are they feeling the trauma itself and working through the feelings of it? Is that kind of how that works? Yeah, kind of. So what we do, it's it's a deep meditation. So I kind of guide, I go in, lead people into this meditation, and then I guide their subconscious through it so that the subconscious remembers their root wound. So maybe someone will come to me saying, you know, I've got a problem with procrastination or I've got resistance to a certain thing and I'm not sure why, but I need to get through it to help my career and to help in normal life. And so we then we go in. And it turns out it's not just resistance. It's some very deep trauma that happened to them when they were a child. Um, usually they know if somebody's been through a traumatic childhood, usually they know um, roughly, you know, I was kind of in an abusive relationship or they might have an inkling of what it is um, consciously. But when we go in, the subconscious takes you exactly to that root wound that you need to know. And it doesn't hurt. You're just revisiting the past. You're not reliving it. Um, okay. And so we kind of heal what needs to be healed, you know, give that inner child love, reconnect someone with, with their inner child and their past self, because, you know, we leave fragments of our soul when we go through trauma. And so you kind of reconnect them with these fragments of soul. You heal their inner child and you heal that wound so that when they come back to the present day, um, then they listen to a meditation for three weeks because it takes 21 days to recode neural pathways. And so then they listen to a meditation. And so they're kind of primed to accomplish that project that they want to accomplish. Wow. Well, that's really, that's really interesting. I mean, I'm a firm believer in therapy and talk therapy and all these different types of therapies. And uh, sometimes those therapies can make you really go back and feel kind of harshly at times, which is okay too, if it works for you, but this seems like a more gentle approach and you can go in and kind of just observe it and work through it there through meditation. So meditation, I've always said meditate or music is my meditation. Cause I've always struggled a little bit with meditation. I've been someone that I have a very busy mind. Um, so I've always struggled with getting into that state. And in fact, I can't do it on my own. I need a guide. I've, I've worked with a few people that guide me through a meditation you know, you're, you've already lived. I tell people when they come to me, they've already gone through the hard part. The hard part is all of those, all of the impact of trauma that is still hurting them, bothering them to this day, you know, causing the flashbacks or the problems in their relationships or their creativity, or, you know, like just sitting and staring at a blank screen, unable to write, um, or, you know, being scattered and unfocused and unable to, you know, just that feeling of overwhelm. So they've been through the hard part. They've lived through it. The healing is the easy part and the part where you get to be rewarded and just be like, oh, where you kind of, you realize why you went through that. It has meaning in your life. You see the significance, you get the lessons that you were meant to learn. And so that's kind of when all of this came together for me and how I got into doing this myself was just having those full circle moments and seeing the meaning and feeling so fulfilled because I was like, you know, I really don't align with the phrase, everything happens for a reason. At the same time, I do believe that everyone has their own particular story. You know, they're on this, this journey for a reason and they're living that story for a reason. And we're getting your challenges are as destined for you as your dreams are. And so if you've got big dreams, you're going to have big challenges and it's, you'll become who you need to be to have the dreams by traveling yeah. through the challenges. I really like that. If you have big dreams, you're going to have big challenges. Um, and that's not, um, I like that just cause I've had big dreams and I've had big challenges and, uh, um, 
I, I really like that. If you have big dreams, you have big challenges. That doesn't have to be looked at as a negative thing because challenges, again, are why we're here, I think, right? I mean, mm. um, I, I listen to a lot of NDEs on top of um, conducting interviews with people and some of them go, why did I, what did I, was I signing up for? And they realize that um, the bigger the challenge, the bigger the soul growth. Some people don't want to come here and go over the top in the challenges, they like to do a little calmer, maybe a few lives at a time instead of coming and just having it all thrown at you at once. Um, but it's, it, it can be a positive way to look at it. If you're going through your big challenges in life, I would probably assume, and people, especially people who have had these experiences can almost with certainty say, well, yes, they're challenging, but you are growing so rapidly as a soul. So, you know, good, like that's, that's a good thing. Um, and I think when you said everything happens for a reason, I also, I believe we have kind of like blueprints of things we're going to go through, but I do believe because we have free will, um, I think there's times where you can say, okay, I've had enough for now. This has been challenging. I, I like, meaning I don't think I, this is just how I feel because I, I think if, if I was my higher self and I was coming here, I think I would want the option to sometimes be like, okay. I'm tapping out for a minute, not meaning tapping out, like leaving and dying, but okay, let's calm this down a little bit and I can work through this in other ways with my soul if it's a little harsh or a little hard. So to have that positive outlook, like, and that's where I think manifestation comes in because I think manifestation is the idea that we can alter or um, grow our life in the direction we want to go as we, as, cause we're still, we're still soul, right? We're here, but we're also there and we're still directing in the direction we want to go. So maybe we do have these obstacles and these, this life plan. And there's probably some heavy plans that we came here for, but I think along the way we can maybe make it a little less of a, a blow, if you will, you know, like if we want, but we have to get on that right energy plane. Does that, does that make sense? Or I think there are a lot of rough times and it definitely gets better when you have a better outlook and positivity when you focus on the bright spots. At the same time, like some things are just like um, so challenging and it doesn't seem fair that people experience them. And and so like the reason I have a problem with, with phrases like everything happens for a reason is people tend to use them in such a trite way. It's almost gaslighting the the pain of the human experience because there's so much pain and we can't gaslight that you know we don't want to like cross over and just kind of pass over what someone has been through um and what people go through you know on a daily basis that's just so hard yeah. but I do think you can manifest and create your own experience through that and that if you focus on the bright spots you will expand those bright spots in your life like the creative flow and bring in more you know, it's going to get okay. better and better. And so it's all about your perspective. It's all about that mental outlook. It, because you're right. The things people go through and, you know, we all think we go through something and then you hear something even more terrible that someone's gone through. And you mm -hmm. think, wow, like what, how they endured that. And it's just, it's disheartening, but um, maybe the way we react to those things. And that's as we probably grow our spiritual um, path, maybe we react in a way that's a little bit different and it can influence us a bit better. So we don't keep going through difficult times, right? Because if we get into like a, a victim mentality, it probably makes it worse. So if we can get out of that sooner, then we can learn that lesson. Maybe then we can go on to the next thing. And I know that's harsh to hear because I'm not saying people go through hard things because they're um, being negative, but um, I think there is something to do with energy that we're working with. And we have to try to always stay on the positive and, I haven't, I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> like I, I'm acting like I'm an expert in it. I, I'm here doing this thing. And there's times where I think, what was I, why, what was going on here? Um, one question I had for you is because of the experience you had, um, do you believe this might be kind of silly to ask now after everything we've talked about, but do you believe when we die, we cease to exist? Or do you now believe that there's something beyond this world, this human world mm -hmm. I have this discussion all the time because um so I moved away from this evangelical background I deconstructed I'm I still firmly align with Jesus 
but I really believe in mystery. And so I believe in the person of Jesus, but I also believe in just the fact that we don't know. Um, in college, I studied um, Michel de Montaigne. He was a Renaissance or no, um, I can't remember. I think he was an early Renaissance um, humanist philosopher. And um, my college thesis was about the view of death and Michel de Montaigne compared to um, Descartes, you know, who is later um, early more generative, kind of started the modern period. And so the difference between them was that Michel de Montaigne saw every experience that we go through in this life, whether it's blowing your nose or having sex or seeing a beautiful place or eating dinner is like preparation for death in that we don't know what's coming, but it's all kind of preparation. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I believe because, and I think these near death experiences are preparation. I think meditation is preparation. I think all of the human experiences are preparation, whether it's sex or creative flow or, you know, what, whatever you're doing, like talking on a podcast, it's all a preparation for death. I don't know what that looks like because, you know, um, I didn't believe in past lives until I began my work as an RTT practitioner. And then I've worked with people so many times who just regressed to past lives. I've regressed to so many past lives and I've had to heal past lives. It could be trauma that's passed down culturally and genetically. It could be, um, hmm you know, it could be the energy that's passed down, or maybe it is a past life. I've, and that's one of those things that I haven't, I just don't fully understand myself, but I'm very open to the mystery. And that is one reason I never really fit into Christianity. Although I grew up in the church and my husband is a minister. Um, he's very open to these gray spaces too. in the, in the mystery. Um, but I just don't like boxes Mm -hmm. And I find it just works better to be like, okay, well, I'm open to that, but I can't fully explain it. And I don't know that I will be able to until that's, I die. That's really interesting. You're, you're probably the first person that's had an NDE to say it like that. Um, most people, when I ask them, do we survive beyond this world? Like it's undoubtedly like a thousand percent. Yes. Because of the experience they had. So, so you're saying that even though you did experience beings that you did experience that you were plotlined and you were in another realm, you still don't have the belief that we survive this human death. Oh, Oh, well, let me retract a little. I do okay. believe in heaven. I do believe and definitely believe in an afterlife. Okay. I just don't know how that fits in with past lives. And, oh, I see. you know, if someone's done, once they finish this particular timeline, if that's them and mm -hmm. they go straight to heaven, it's, that's their soul journey completed. Or if they go back down, um, I kind of believe past lives may be this energy that's transferred from certain souls to another, but I don't know how that transference occurs. That's and interesting. I guess that's one of those mysteries that really mm -hmm. intrigues me that I can't yeah. fully explain. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Okay, so you do you do believe that we are bigger than our meat suit, as we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. so that we're bigger than this, that this, this experience, once this experience ceases to exist, the body disintegrates, essentially. It's kind of sadistic to say, but, you know, that's what <laughs> happens. And then something about us still exists, but you don't know um, if we have more of these experiences. And I can understand that. I had a... I had a past life regression done on me and I, I was a woman. I was this Greek goddess woman that was married to a rich man. And I remember, and then there was a few other ones I had and it was incredibly real. Like I even, I have it recorded and it's hard to, cause I'm, I'm like the, the, uh, the alpha male type person. So I don't really have a lot of um, like, I have some feminine qualities in regards to love and like, but I don't, come across as feminine so to hear myself talking almost in a feminine way even when i was talking during the during the experience recorded it was kind of humorous like i laughed the first time i listened back but then i was like wow yeah i remember i remember looking down and seeing i was very like i was hot like i was very beautiful i had like i was very like fit and i had this little uh flowing thing um like dress and i remember being very i probably would have been egotistical i would think because i was 
the way I looked, but I remember feeling like very uh, feminine and even the way I talked. And I, and then I, I remember I, I said this in previous podcasts, I gave a name and I went on to research the name and in the, you know, 1600s in Greek, it was a common female name. And I had never heard the name before. So I remember that, that, and I talked to the therapist about that and he was blown away too. Um, Cause he was kind of somewhat skeptical as well, even though he does the work. And mm -hmm. I don't know whether that was my experience in past life, or if I was jumping into someone's life and experiencing them together, like my soul merged with their soul and I got to feel what it was like. That's the, where I get a little bit like, I'm like, I don't know which one that was. All I know is I was very good at it because I was out and it felt like 20 minutes and apparently it was three hours and uh, it was a real cool experience. Oh, that is amazing. I love hearing about that. I recently did a session for a girl and she, um, she regressed into this woman. It was amazing because I got this name in my head and then she started saying the name Wow! and this girl that she was regressing to was saying her name anyhow. So she, she was so um, moved by this session that afterwards she couldn't forget about her. And she spent a long time researching and she found the woman that she regressed to. She knows exactly who it is, a historical figure. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. That, and she didn't know about this person before? No, neither of us did. She's wow. like very obscure, but she found exactly who it is. She can show you a picture. It was mind blowing. And um, yeah, I've personally, I regress to people who I know are like in my family, you know, like ancestors. Um, I regress to some people who could be in it. I've regressed to being a man as well. Um, and I think we're all, we're all just very fluid like that, that souls are fluid. Um, energy is fluid. Yeah. And no, that's... I think people need to be more open to just, yeah, we're not fixed, you know? And, and that's, that's fascinating to know that she actually found who she was. It's kind of like those experiences where you hear someone, a young child tells you who their past life was. And then they go, they go out to someone went to Ireland with their child and they found the person this young three or four year old was talking about. And they're like, how do we explain that? Like, that's incredible, mm -hmm. but it's a mystery because we can't say it's because he was that person. We can assume that, but just like anything in life, we're just assuming at that point, we don't know all the answers. Your experience, um, did it help you in regards to how to overcome other illnesses or anything that you run into? Um, cause you did mention like, you know, you, you overcame a severe illness. I'm assuming that was partially of what you were talking about this recovery. Um, but did, has it helped you going forward with things? And if so, how? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of like eating a live frog in the morning. Like nothing's ever going to be that hard. I also know exactly why I'm here in this life. I'm here to heal trauma. I'm here to heal it in myself. I'm here to help others heal. And I'm here not only to help heal, but to create, because that is the pinnacle of when we're fully healed, we create. And that is who we're meant to be is everyone is intrinsically creative. Um, so I know without a shadow of, of a doubt, that's why I'm here. So the other illness was actually caused by the trauma that I went through. Um, I found like through college, through my twenties, I kept going through number one, through these very traumatic experiences, like I had more traumatic experiences than anyone I know because there was like the boating accident. Then in college, I actually had this stalker who waited for me and chased me with like a machete, managed oh to get away. But so I would have these extremely traumatic experiences happen like that. And, um, and then eventually I found that the trauma, well, I didn't know what it caused it at the time, but I started to have these really weird physical symptoms as well, like really uncomfortable um, illnesses, like weird chronic diseases that I just kept popping out one after another. And I was like, why do I have so many effing chronic diseases? You know, it's like, mm. this is like, I know there's like an epidemic of chronic illness right now. Um, but so when I was kind of going through this, there was not as much, as many things online. I just felt so alone, um, couldn't find help with doctors. So I searched for eight years to find any kind of help or support from mainstream 
um, medical world. And I finally got this world renowned surgeon who was able to diagnose, um, Oh, I can't think of the name of it right now. It's a very popular disease. <laughs> popular is not the, the right word, but <laughs> sorry. It's just like escaped me like the name of it. Um, <laughs> It'll probably come back. I don't usually like claim these diseases because I've so yeah. I healed from one, like the surgery helped me heal. Um, And then he diagnosed this other one that was actually the main cause of all the pain. Because at that point I was in so much pain. I was almost bedridden. I knew that it was going to get, it was just, getting worse and worse and worse, progressively worse. And I felt like I was going around in this spiral and that I was going to be dead in a few years because it was just getting so bad and it was so hard to survive and no one could explain it. Um, oh, so one of them was endometriosis and he was able to do a surgery for that. The other one was interstitial cystitis, which is just like, it's a, one of the worst pain diseases in the world. And um, he told me it's incurable. And I remember I was I'd moved back to my parents' house to just have the surgery and recover for two weeks and had my little boy who was three or four and my husband. And I was just like, I don't want it to get worse. Like I, I just told the universe, I knew it was like this moment where it was up to me to make this decision. And at that point I'd learned so much about manifestation mm -hmm. that I was like, you know what? I am going to manifest a cure. No cure just means there's no cure yet. And so, um, from that moment on, I stopped looking to the medical world, although I was happy to get as much help as I could. It was just this, um, this guy who was a specialist in this told me, you know, there's nothing you can do. It'll just get worse. And all of the research that I did said that all of the medicine makes it worse. Um, so anyhow, and people usually get eventually paralyzed from it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and at that point it was so, so bad. So anyhow, sitting on the bed at my parents' house and hung up the phone with this surgeon. I was just like, that is not my reality. I am going to heal this disease. And I had just recently learned about the connection between trauma and disease um, right before that. And that had kind of explained so much about why I was getting these diseases because trauma impacts your cells so that your cells, you know, um, are hurt or suffering and your body isn't able to function. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to have to heal my cells. I'm going to have to heal my energy field, heal my subconscious and heal my conscious mind. And, um, I was in tons of, you know, support groups for this disease where, you know, people were in the same, going down the cesspool of just like misery because it was so painful getting worse and worse and no cure, but I managed to heal it within six months because of all of these different things and just this pure belief that I could heal it. And that mm -hmm. was largely because I'd already been through an incurable, you know, experience and yeah. I had healed that as well. Wow. Okay. I also believe that. And again, I want to say this and put a disclaimer out there that if someone is ill and they feel that the medical field will help them in any way, you need to follow your gut and go for that to make sure that you're okay. But I truly do believe that a lot of it is our, I, I look at like the mind body um, connection and how we, if we're not dealing with traumas correctly, um, we can keep going down this illness road. And the best thing we can do is deal, deal with our traumas and work through them. I'm glad that you're on recovery of it. But like you said, it took the work. It took probably the meditation and, and things like that. Right. So thanks for sharing that. And um, now you said you do work with people. Where, where can people find you? Like, where can they if they want to work with you and do you have like a website, do you have anything that you can share like in regards to that? Oh, fantastic. Yes. So my website is so in flow with Molly Murray, or you can just look me up on Facebook, follow me, friend me. Um, it's facebook.com slash hello, Molly Murray. Um, I'm also on Instagram as so in flow with Molly Murray. I've started a TikTok, which I'm going to post on more and more TikTok makes me feel very old, but I am going to do it. It's flow <laughs> magic with a K, <laughs> but Facebook is probably the best way to find me. That's perfect. And I can get you to send me those links. So that way I can put them in the, the end notes and people can find them. But so, so in flow, is there, is that the website is like a .com or anything? Or is there anything like that? Or Oh yeah. So in flow with Molly Murray.com. Oh, Thank okay. you so much for asking. And 
I've got a tech guy now who's helping me and he's going to change it to flowmagic.com. <laughs> so it's much easier to find. Yeah, that'll be a little bit easier. It's a long name. So switching it down to that will make it a little bit easier for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, um, <laughs> I've loved this conversation. I feel like I could talk to you for two more hours. I do have to end it, of course, as all these episodes. I try to keep it within about an hour or so, but I always end it with this question. And the question is, whatever comes to your heart, just kind of say it. Now that you've had your experiences in life and you continue to go through your experiences, you had your NDE. Why are we here as humans? Like, What is the purpose of our being here? Oh, I love that. We are here to create. We are here to create a new world, a new experience for ourselves. We are here to heal. Um, and I think we're here to heal in order so that we can heal others and create, you know, we all have this ripple effect. And when you do what you're here to do, when you follow those nudges of your soul, you just create this huge ripple and waves around the world. When you heal yourself, you heal others. And I know that the world can be such a devastating place. There's so much injustice. There's so many things that need to change. I don't think we're going to pull them down by revolution. I think we're going to literally create a new world by following the nudges of our hearts and creating those visions that are here for us to create. So go and create amazing things. I love that. I've never had someone, anyone say that yet. So I love that. Go and create. Mm -hmm. I usually turn to everybody right now and I say, thank you so much for subscribing to the podcast. Please make sure you're sharing these stories. They can be, they could be a, a, a huge healer for a lot of people. So trying to get the message out. If you haven't, haven't hit the subscribe button, please make sure you're subscribing. And if you are, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Molly, for being on the show. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Joe. What an amazing experience. I take care. So